Hello, and welcome to the Random House Children's Books Fall 2023 Preview. I'm Maggie Reagan, Books for Youth Senior Editor at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. If you have any trouble, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the captions icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide captions from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates the standards of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of the organizers, be immediately removed. We have a wonderful preview from the Random House Children's School and Library team, but first we'll hear a conversation with Senior Executive Editor Nancy Sisko and author Carl Hyacin. Carl was born and raised in Florida, where he still lives. He's the author of many best-selling novels, including Squeeze Me and Razor Girl. His books for younger readers include the Newbery Honor winner Hoot, as well as Flush, Scat, Chomp, Skink No Surrender, and Squirm. Carl is joined by his editor, Nancy Sisko, who is a senior executive editor at Alfred A. Knopf Books for Young Readers. Nancy has been with Knopf for more than 25 years and has had the pleasure of working with Carl Hyacin on all of his books for young readers. Thank you both so much for joining us today. We are. Hello, Carl. How are Hi, you? Good. <laughs> Hello. Good. Good to Good. see you. It's good to see everybody that I can't see beyond that. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. Well, just to set up a little bit, I just we're so pleased to have you here to talk about Wrecker. Um, there are several things you can count on in a Hyacin book. You will be in Florida. You will snort laugh. There will be some outlandish crime. And the criminals will get what's coming to them in very satisfying ways. In Wrecker, I definitely laughed, but I also cried, Carl, which is new. Um, the story takes place in Key West, so you might guess that the criminals in this book are smugglers. Our hero is Valdez Jones, who calls himself Wrecker because he's incredibly proud of his great, 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 great grandfather, I think I got the right number of greats, who salvaged shipwrecks for a living. So it's ironic when Wrecker comes upon a speedboat, run aground on a sand flat. The men in the boat do not want him to call for help. In fact, they will pay him to forget that he ever saw them. And so begins this kid's entanglement with a very timely smuggling operation. And the fun of this book, of course, is seeing how he manages to untangle himself and tie the crooks in knots instead. Um, Carl, this book paints such a vivid portrait of Key West, both uh, past and present. You know, Can you talk about like what made you want to set a book there? Well, it's always a, it, it's always been a, um, a sort of a legendary hangout for for smugglers and outlaws going back a couple hundred years, and it's uh, literally the, the end of the highway now. And when you drive to the end of US one, mile marker zero is in Key West, and I've spent a lot of time in the Keys. I used to live down there, and uh, it still has uh, it's changed a lot, but it still has um, layers of a. Uh, intrigue to it and for uh, and I to put myself in the mind of a, a kid that actually is growing up there and has that kind of a legacy because it was a town that at one point had the highest per capita income 
of anywhere in the United States went back when, when wrecking was in full boom because they were the, the ships come ashore and everyone hops in the boat and you go out and, and the wreckers got to keep a percentage of what was in the boat. And most of the time it wasn't gold or, I mean, it was bales of cotton and things, but it was brutal, hard, grueling work. And, you're, and, and they're doing it in the middle of storms, sometimes hurricanes. So it, it has a lot of, that always intrigued me, that part of Key West. and. Um, and and the legacy that lived on with the rum runners and then the then the marijuana smugglers and then it was cocaine and and it just there's always it's always something in transit down there and i just i spent a lot of time there and i, I just like the place it's a very uh it's probably one of the most colorful places in florida i would say that's saying a lot <laughs> um your books you know, often have kind of a ripped from the headlines elements to them. Um, and in this book in particular, there's there's COVID and also an interesting storyline about how the Islanders tried to ban some of the really huge cruise ships from docking mm -hmm. there, only to have that ban kind of overturned by feckless politicians. Um, and I remember all of this was playing out as you were writing. As books. I was writing it. Yeah, it yeah. was kind of a moving target because one of the things that has changed so much about Key West for anyone who hasn't been there is they've started allowing these giant cruise liners and it's a fairly small harbor and in docking these things they turn around and when they do they, this huge swath of mud is created because they draw so much water and the mud washes over the reefs and the coral and the flats and it's it's terrible for the environment so the, the people who live there have been fighting this for years um the, the people because the cruise ships pull up in the morning these these people get out they walk around they get a rum runner and buy a t-shirt and then they go back to the boat and get drunk um it, it's it's not necessarily kind of tourism that is they want i mean they they want families to come they want the people who stay in the hotels and, and go to the restaurants and everything so they've been there's a lot of reasons they didn't want it and the city had a refer two referendums one uh, not long ago, they overwhelmingly voted to re restrict the size and the frequency that these ships come in. And, uh, and then our, uh, our governor um, uh, signed a piece of legislation that nullified the, basically the entire election um, uh, because he said that he, they passed a law saying that municipalities can't regulate their own ports or decide what comes in and out of their port. And the, the bill was sponsored by someone who doesn't have cruise ships coming into their port. And, and, and just as I'm sure this is just a coincidence, but uh, Governor DeSantis um, uh, received uh, his, his PAC, his PAC received a million dollar contribution from the owner of the main uh, cruise ship terminal in Key West shortly before the legislation was signed. I'm, I'm sure there was no connection at all between those two events. So, um, but but the people there were still upset and they did little flotillas and protests. They've done everything they could to make democracy stick. And so that was, that's a subplot because that's a real thing. And still the battle is still going on down there over this. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I love, you know, all the things that come up in your books that I'm like, that seems like a stretch. And you're like, no, no, that part's real. <laughs> <You> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> the really, the really sick parts are the real parts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately. I know. It's hard. I know. I think what I, I loved about this book, especially, is that you're bringing in history more than I've seen you do before. Like, I love the wreckers who are our heroes, ancestors. And then, you know, the, you know, spending so much time in the graveyard, which we should talk about, um, yeah. gave you a really good way to kind of bring in a lot of the, you know, tragic tragic history about Manuel Cabeza yeah, and, the KK, was, you know. and, and a lot of, when I when I'm writing in the book I did spend a lot of time in a great not in daytime not nighttime but uh, <laughs> and uh, they have some very famous tombs and and uh, uh, war heroes and other characters who are buried in the Key West cemetery on Solaris Hill <clears throat> and uh, so you I just walk around taking notes and some of the and you know looking up some of the things and and uh, uh, but they uh it, it's still a graveyard, but it's not, it's like a major tourist attraction, you know, and they have little roads throughout the graveyard. So you'll see like an Uber pull up and tourists get out to take a picture of a tombstone, which doesn't happen at that many uh, cemeteries. But one of the person, one of the persons who's buried in this uh, graveyard was a, was a fellow, uh, in real, you know, true life. He was, um, he was lynched in Key West back in the twenties. Uh, and, and this was at a time when the, the Ku Klux Klan ran the whole 
city. Every, everybody, almost virtually everybody in power was a member of the Klan. And um, it was a racial lynching at a, at a time when, uh, believe it or not, a lot of people don't know this, but there was a period in the, in the early 20s when, when Florida had more lynchings of that kind than anywhere in the country, more than Alabama, more than Mississippi. Wow. And uh, people don't know that. It doesn't get advertised a lot. Um, but this happened at the height of that, that fever, that the, the Klan's power. And uh, interestingly enough, only a few years later, they were completely more or less vanquished. They, they were more went underground. But at the time, it was very open. And um, so that's, uh, that's another subplot is that uh, the, the, the Valdez, the, the, the main character in the book, um, uh, stumbles into this, into the backstory of what happened to this guy and, and then is drawn into the present time uh, with the same, with the same story. And it is tragic, but it, it really, it really happened. I mean, that's this, one of the things that drew me to Key West is that there's so much history that it's almost impossible to, to write a book set down there where you aren't stumbling over it here and there, because it, it does shape the way that the city is now as, as different as it is. But the, the, you know, it's, it's only a, it's a small island. It's about four square miles. And, and there's, it's not growing in the sense that there's really nowhere else to build anything. So you have all the old houses and the geography is, is almost the same as it was 100, 150 years ago in terms of the streets and all that, but that, yeah. that made it kind of fun too. Yeah, I know. I think it is because like it has, you know, Key West has such a laid back vibe right now you know as you think of it as the most like relaxed place in the country so it is you know my you know realizing some of the history I think was pretty eye-opening um and for your characters as well you know I think like you know Wrecker's like surprised when he you know reads about this and you know the girl he meets Willie has her own connections too that yeah. and, the, and the families there are still a lot of very old line, what we call comp families, or if you're in Key West, Bubba's, uh, they've, they've come from generations of, uh, and they all came from somewhere else, and many of them from the Bahamas, many of them from up the eastern seaboard, um, when the wrecking trade, uh, this is before steamships, so these are boats under sail, and they couldn't navigate as quickly if they saw a reef at night, I mean, they just crashed into the reef, um, and, and uh, there, were no, there was no lighthouse system in place. In, in, in that period of time. So all of that is very intriguing, but you also have to appreciate how tough they were to get through it and have generations of them because it was a very, very hard way to make a living. And, and but, you know, my introduction to Key West as a journalist, um, when, I, when I was working for the Herald in 19, well, I'm dating myself, but I think it was 1979, we did a series down there. We went and rented a house down there. It, we, it was called Smuggler's Island. And it was about how the marijuana trade had pervaded every element of Key West society, but also the institutions, state attorney's office, courts, everything was, uh, and in those days, that was before cocaine. So marijuana smugglers were basically fishermen, had fishing boats, and they had a chance to make $10,000 in cash in one night wow. to go pick up a load of, of weed and bring it in. Because at night, it, it's still tricky to navigate down there. And it had really taken over the whole town in the sense of everybody knew a smuggler. If they, if they weren't living with a smuggler or married to a smuggler, dating a smuggler, they knew a smuggler. Their dad was or their brother was. And it, that was just, that, that, that was the time. And, it, and um, that's over now, but there's still, I still sure there's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of illicit cargo going in and out of that town now. Yes, and and you've invented some new interesting illicit cargo coming in that that uh, yeah, Valdez has to. You know. Yeah, we won't give it away, but yeah, no, it's, exactly, it's, it's something very valuable for its time, and and uh, he's, he's not sure what to do with it. But um, you know, I still I still go down there a lot just for fun and for the fishing and uh, uh, for the memories of uh, you know when I was a kid and we used to go to the Keys all the time. But I just thought it would be a great story to tell. Just to, you know, as a kid, all he's got is his bicycle and he's got a little boat with a, with a little tiny outboard motor on and he goes out fishing, you know, by himself, <clears throat> excuse me, at sunset, which is an incredibly gorgeous scene down there in the, in the Keys and it's famous, but that was his whole world and all of a sudden it sort of gets turned upside down 
and because of where he is at the either the wrong or the right place at the right time depending on how you look at it yeah exactly i know i love the scenes of of wrecker out on the water just like you know clearing his head <laughs> you know and enjoying the you know like he's he's somebody who feels like more at home on the water than he does on land which i think is interesting yeah, and in the opening where he's out there fishing by himself, just wants to be left alone in this giant speedboat. We, co we call them go fasts or cigarette boats. Um, and they were really developed as offshore racing boats and then were adopted by the drug trade because they were so fast that the Coast Guard couldn't catch them back in the day. And, uh, and, and he sees one of those go by all glittery and fast and it just, you know, then crashes right into a tidal bank and and it's not he's not floating off anytime soon but i've seen i've seen that happen most of the, most of us who spent our child a lot of our childhoods on the water have watched that unfold usually we clap when we see it <laughs> you know it's an excellent nice job, nice job. And, and somebody always wants you to tow them off and they're they're in a boat that weighs four tons and you're in this little tiny skiff and you go oh yeah i'll, I'll tell you but, <laughs> but that's a scene that a lot of kids in Florida could relate to. And I certainly could from my own childhood. Yeah, yeah, we, yes, we found some like, kid readers in Key West just to like, you know, make sure it sounded true. And they were like, mm-hmm, yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly, I know, I know. Well, I'd love how you combine, you know, like the, you know, kind of the grittier aspects of, <laughs> of yeah. life and also the, the beautiful nature of the place. You know, I just, I really appreciate how you kind of don't, try to sugarcoat things for kids. You never talk down to kids. You know, you kind of show the world and all its crummy, crooked <laughs> ineptitude, but, but you also give us characters who care and who are just fighting the good fight for what it is. Yeah, so I feel like I always leave your book feeling like both wiser to the ways of the world and also like I can do something about it. You know, like they're a very positive feeling in the way. Well, yeah, and I'm, you know me, I'm such a feel good guy. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so, you know, no, Norwegians are famous for being high spirited and positive, you know. Uh, but I, I do think, I mean, there, I've, we've talked about this before and, and, and going back to Hoot, which was a, a book, and th that was a, a story about those little owls that I mean, was sort of ripped right out of my own childhood. And that was the first book for young readers. So I dumb, you were the one who said, whatever you do, don't write down to them. And, but in my own, in my own childhood, the story of those allows didn't end, it ended very sadly. Um, but when you, when you write fiction, you get a crack to rewrite the ending and, and make it end any way you wanted to. So for me, it was selfish because, okay, I'm going to write this story and this time, the good guys are going to win and, and the birds are going to be okay. So it, I'm, I'm not sure that's a literary decision, but if, if for me, it <laughs> felt good to do it. Yeah. I know. And I love, of course, how you, you know, in the kids' books, it's always a kid who manages to, like, you know, thwart the bad guys, make a better decision, <laughs> you know, kids getting the better of adults is always, is always great fun, you know, <laughs> so. You know, and, and when you yeah. think about it, even though all people ask me about how can you, how, how, why, first of all, why would anyone let you write a children's book is the first <laughs> question I get asked. And then the second one is, says, well, what, what qualifies you to do it? And I said, well, for, first of all, I'm not emotionally that far from adolescence, even at my age. But second of all, in, in the newspaper business, especially writing a column as I did for, I don't know, I wrote the column for 35, 36 years or something. I said, basically all I did every day was make fun of grownups. In, in the news, I mean, because grownups do stupid things. That, the newspapers would be out of business if grownups didn't do stupid things. I said, so you just, I took that mentality of the books and, and kids love it when they read about grownups doing stupid things because they watch us doing these things all the time yeah. in real life. It wasn't that big a leap for me. I didn't feel like it was that hard, that hard a transition thing. I know. I remember one of the first reviews of who like cracked me up because it said, you know, it was surprising to see you writing for kids. And then they're like, but thinking about it, you know, <laughs> there was kind of a, a 12 year old cackle going on in the background in I as a book. And I'm like, yeah. oh, fair point, fair point. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I probably will all be reevaluated now because, uh, uh, because of uh, the, the Florida's uh, new uh, regime of, uh, of purging books and, uh, you know, including Amanda Gorman's poem and all this other, I mean, it's, 
it's very distressing um, to all of us, but at the same time, it's, 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 it's ludicrous. And, um, you know, I've had books, I can't say banned. I had, I had a book banned from the, uh, the Texas prison system because they thought it'd be a bad influence on <laughs> inmates. I, I, I was, I was, yeah. I was more almost as proud of that as I was yeah. of, the, of the Newberry. I thought <laughs> it wake up, ha, ha, a bad influence on prison. And it was a book about bass fishing. It was a satirical <laughs> book. I, I don't know how they thought I could corrupt the prison. <laughs> so I, I've been dealing with it. I mean, I get clips occasionally about it, but now it's, now it's in full storm here where I live too in this in Indian River County. And it's quite a, it's it's actually galvanized a lot of very sensible parents who are now showing up at the school board meetings to have little chats with the uh, the it's usually the moms of liberty moms for liberty come there's usually only one in yeah. the county and that's who's there so uh but you know it's a battle that, that needs to be fought over and over again as you know it, it never goes yeah. away well i'm glad to hear that that's you know <laughs> there are people fighting back so <laughs> We're we're with them. <laughs> no, yeah. we're with you. no, you yeah. you you all right in the middle of it, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's fascinating. Um, I love how you know. I think in reading Wrecker, like the whole like last third of the book, when you kind of see it, you know, all the events kind of tumble out, and you you know, Wrecker finds his way out of the mess. Like I think the last third, I was just like, yes, do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I had nothing to do. Like, is that like, do you know where you're going when you're writing or? I have no idea. No, yeah. No, so I don't. It must I be don't. like incredibly satisfying when you figure out how you're going to get yeah. out of it. <laughs> no. uh, I, it's, it's usually what well, you and I have talked about. You've stopped, you've known better than to stop asking what's going to happen next because I don't know. And I forget the great, the great writer, and I forget with Nepal or someone who said, for him, uh, writing was like driving with your headlights on. You only see as far as the, the headlights go and you don't know what's coming over the hill around the bend. And that's kind of how I write. So, but I'm about, I usually get about two thirds of the way through. And then, then, the, then I see, okay, this is, this is who's gonna be standing at the end. And this is, this is who's, you know, and, and Elmore Leonard, who was a good, a really good friend of mine. And he, I was at an event with him one time and they, they Mr. Leonard, Mr. Leonard, some guy that had read all 600 of his books or something said, do you know how your books end when you start? And he goes, well, why would I write them if I knew how they were going to end? And that was, that's the best answer I can give too. Cause it's gotta be fun. You, I mean, it can't be like you're locked into it. I, I wish I was organized enough to do an outline, but I, and it would be easier because you, you, but it's more fun when the characters, all of them surprised me. The, the character of Valdez and Willie, all of these characters ended up doing things on a page that I maybe didn't think they were going to do. And it takes you a little different directions. And it's like real life. None of us have a script. I mean, none of us, our lives are scripted, you know? <laughs> so it must, I mean, it must, I know. I, I mean, you ever writing along and thinking, how am I going to get out of this? You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. agony. I, I, mean, I asked yesterday, I asked to uh, do a Zoom with a, a writing class. And I almost just came out and said, don't do it the way I do it. Whatever you do, don't do this because it, it's, 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 it's like walking on a highway. You don't know how you're going to, how in the world it, does this even make sense? And, you know, you, it just, these characters, they live in your head. When, you know, you can stop writing and go do something with your family, but they're, they're alive in your head and they're torturing you the whole duration of the manuscript. So it's it's nice to finally get it in order where you think okay this, okay I see the way out I, I see how this is going to go, but I, I had never been able to do an outline or have any plan whatsoever. I think it's either laziness or just disorganization. I'm not sure which. <laughs> well, it's working for you, so we won't worry about it. I know. Um, there's a question that came in from the audience that I think is actually interesting to talk about, um, and they're asking, do you are you, do you find yourself being more cautious um, in writing with all the state bans coming out? You know, like, no, you know, I feel like there's a lot more criticism and like, yeah. You read the book. Back. Yeah. <laughs> you read the book. Did I, did I seem more cautious to you? No. <laughs> no. 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 If, if um, anything, the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think, I think if anything over the years, I've become more you know, mindful of, of people's feelings, but never with regard to politics or, or, or the, the constitution or the right, or 
you know, the arm, sort of the unvarnished truth. And I think kids see right through it. If you're like you said, sugarcoating it or stepping around or being dainty about something, because that's not the, how they talk to each other. And that's not how they see things. And so in that sense, you have to remain honest to it. And, and some of the topics are difficult. And, uh, but I, I don't, there are things that I know that I'm not qualified to write about it. I wouldn't try. And I certainly wouldn't make them an object of satire. There are certain subjects that just, I don't care how you come out them. They're not funny. And, and they're, they're not something you, you, you want to have, you know, you just can't make them humorous. But I think in, in terms of what's going on now, I think the worst thing you can do, I mean, you know, I mean, it's like Judy Bloom has been dealing with this for her whole writing career. And she's back in the middle of it. And, and, and she, I'm, I'm quite sure she hasn't changed her attitude or her style of writing one, one bit. And I think that would be the, that would be the tragic thing when people start um, uh, backing down and saying, oh my gosh, you know, is this gonna, uh, ever, they're gonna be afraid to put this in the school. They were afraid to put, you can't live with yourself like that. It's not, it's, it's not, you want it to stand up. You know, you want the book to stand on its own and they'll find it. They'll, your, your readers will find it. Um, and uh, I mean, I've often fantasized, what, I'm, this probably wouldn't go over big with the retailers, but uh, if, if there was a particular school that had banned a book, I was just gonna, I would just buy boxes of them and I would put them out in the parking lot where the school buses are and I'd just say free books and give them away at the end of, end, end of the class, let everyone have one that way, you know? Um, and uh, put a, I'd dress like Ron DeSantis. I'd put on a suit that was really way too big, <laughs> the same little tie, you know. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll, I haven't changed. I, I don't think I don't know what it's like for writers starting out. Whether they're now going in more, I can't speak for them. But I just know that you, I'm not going to I'm not going to get any more careful. I you know um, I, I I think I think you, this is not a time to do that right now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I know, I've been curious, like, you know, you retired the column a few years ago and I wonder if you ever, you know, are there things happening that you're just like, ugh, I wish I could write about that or is it- Well, look at, you know, look at the arraignment and- the, yeah. the A lot of news coming Miami out of Florida, Carl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, no, I mean, almost every day I see something and I think, God, I, I kind of wish I had a column to do that in and, and done a little bit of freelancing, but I have to say, honestly, it, it, it been with, I was with the newspaper for, you know, I think 46 years. That's enough. I mean, God, that's, that's something's wrong with me. That's way too long. And, <laughs> and, and I, I'm enjoying just concentrating on the novels. I have to say that, yeah, I get pissed off enough to write a column if I want to go do that. And they would print it if I wanted to go do it. But I think there's other voices. There's other people that are feeling the same thing now. And there's a lot of noise on the internet. And I, I just feel like, I, I really, at this point, I, I would like to just focus on, on the novels. And, I, and I'm writing the same number of days that I wrote before, which is every day. And that hasn't changed. It's just that I don't have a day when I do the newspaper column. But sure, I mean, you, anybody who writes in Florida, the material is, is unbelievable. And, uh, uh, and, and you, you either laugh or cry at it. Uh, but, um, you know, and, the, and we have all until this election cycle, you know, to, to be tortured down here yeah i know i mean there's that but then there's also like you know seaweed coming at you like you know? the, the sea level is sea level is rising uh and and uh you know the hurricanes are getting worse and all that's all that's happening um so uh i don't know i thought about vermont or maine or somewhere but i i would free i would freeze in in july in those oh yeah, yeah yeah i couldn't do it i, I don't think so Carl. no i know I mean, you have certainly done a good job of, you know, both, you know, making me want to see these places and making me never want to <laughs> go to the state. I, I swear. Are I, you trying to help tourism or hurt, Carl? What do you think? Well, <laughs> you know, I think in this book, in Wrecker, I think I'm afraid I might have made Key West more appealing. I mean, selfishly, the, you know, the, the last thing we really, they're going to kill me. The last thing we really want are more tourists, right? If you're a Floridian, that's kind of the last thing you want. But on the other hand, it is a cool place and people go there for the right reasons and it's still beautiful. And, um, you know, you can still be out in a boat and a school of dolphins comes by and there's manatees swimming around. And I mean, you see all that that was there so many, you know, 
thousands of years ago. And it, it's pretty cool. And it's a cool place to bring your kids for that. I wouldn't necessarily take them to Duval Street on a Friday night. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't go there either on a Friday. <laughs> you know, you can go hang out in the cemetery with the iguanas and stuff. I did. I did go by there last time we were down there. We went by there at night. We were walking. I didn't. You can't get in, but I, there are a couple places I think you can. You're not supposed to. But I just thought, I think I've seen enough of this, you know. And I do. I do. I do have a video of the iguana. The iguanas in the cemetery. In the cemetery, and they live under the gravestones in the tombs. And it's creepy, you know. You walk up to them, and they you see a tail disappearing under these old broken. Con I've got. I, I'll send you the video. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll put it on my social media. <laughs> good, Anyone yeah. who really has a burning desire to see a giant reptile crawling under somebody's grave. But, oh, don't we? We all do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> who does does everybody like that? Oh my god. <laughs> oh, for sure. I know. I mean, yeah. So, like, you know, in typical hyacinth fashion, you know. If, Valdez's job is to like clean the clean the iguana poop off of a yeah. gravestone you know you're like <laughs> yeah he, he gets hired there there's a, a a woman young woman who had died tragically and and her brother who was older now had hired him paid him to go in there and, and clean the gravestone because iguanas they they do poop they're not they have no respect for the, the human dead <laughs> so he you know he'd sneak in the cemetery that's where we sort of made it was sneak in the cemetery at night to clean off and make her her headstone as pristine as he could and bec um, because if you're there and you have a loved one there and you're walking around you the first thing you think is well, who took a crap on the grave and then yeah. a giant lizard <laughs> there yeah and you can't really do anything about them they just don't listen so i thought i thought it would be a good if you're it's a good job for a kid a teenager it, it, it's character building don't you think <laughs> definitely <laughs> yeah the kind of job yeah. i would have had i had i worked I, at, I worked at a daycare center as a janitor when i was in middle school oh that was fun oh yeah yeah <laughs> I know. i'd rather be in the graveyard scraping off the iguana yeah i know uh, well it, it does allow me to use the phrase iguana poop in in copy yeah, which how know, often... is, is a new thing for me yeah <laughs> you know how carl the joys that? of working with carl <laughs> <laughs> yeah who else i know oh thank you so much carl it's been such a pleasure to have you here like oh it's fun it's great seeing you yeah are there are there any other comments from the questions or, or am I wrapping it up? They're numb. They're stunned by this they're conversation. Done. They're stunned. They have no questions. <laughs> it's, it's lunchtime and they're all feeling pleased. Exactly, so I know. Well, we'll let them talk about some other books now. All right. <laughs> yeah, Thanks yeah. for having me on this uh, webinar, it's called. Yes, yes. It was fantastic. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. A big thank you to Carl and Nancy for getting us off to such a great start with that wonderful conversation. I'm going to also give a warm welcome to all of you out in the audience. Thank you for joining us for the Random House Children's Books Fall 2023 preview. I am Katie Halata, the Director of Library Marketing, and on behalf of the full school and library team, we are just thrilled to have you here with us today. We're excited to share some of our amazing books that we have coming in fall, and we're going to kick things off with picture books. Starting off with picture books, we have three titles that will be publishing simultaneously in English and in Spanish. First up, we have Esperanza Carmela, the Star of Noche Buena. This is a festive Christmas tale featuring Esperanza Carmela, a, a sugar spun ornament come to life on Christmas Eve. As Esperanza whirls and twirls through the bakery, disaster strikes as the Noche Buena cake is knocked to the floor. Can the cake be saved in time for Christmas? The clock is ticking, but on Noche Buena, anything is possible. Next slide. Papita meets Babita. Welcoming a new baby can be hard, especially for a puppy who's used to being the center of attention. What do you mean Mammy is too busy to bounce a ball for Papita? And Pappy can't seriously not have time to find any time to scratch her ears. But along the way, the two will grow to love one another and become a family with even more smiles and even more heartwarming moments. Next slide. Next, we have a debut picture book biography that tells the story of Latin American icon, Mercedes Sosa. From folk festivals to Carnegie Hall and the Sistine Chapel, Mercedes performed the world over, sharing stories through song. 
Mercedes songs, I'm sorry, Mercedes Sosa songs were about what it means to be human. And her songs of struggle always spoke to the truth of injustices that so many workers and families in Latin America faced. But not everyone loved her singing. A military dictatorship ruled over Argentina and they saw the power of her voice and she was exiled. But even from exiled, exile, Mercedes Sosa was a beacon of freedom for her people. Coupled with bright and breathtaking illustrations, this is a story that will surely inspire and empower young readers. And now I'll kick things over to Erica. Hi, I'm Erica and I'm here to present some more picture books. Um, the sky has so much to show you, my little sweet boy. Let every color, shape, and season fill your world. Hilary Duff, the New York Times bestselling author of My Little Brave Girl, inspires young boys to be as gentle as they are strong in this beautiful book, exploring the, the tumbles and triumphs of childhood. The pages are filled with wishes for her son and encouragements for boys everywhere to embrace all life has to offer them. Next slide. The first children's book from the best-selling author of We Should All Be Feminists and Americana, a tender story of a little girl's love for her mother's scarf and the adventures she shares with it and her whole family. Chino loves the scarf that her mama ties around her hair at night, but when mama leaves for the day, what happens to her scarf? Chino takes it on endless adventures. Peeking through the colorful haze of the silky scarf, Chino and her toy, Bunny, can look at the whole family as they go through their routines. With stunning illustrations from Joelle Avellino, Mama's Sleeping Scarf is a celebration of family and a touching story about the everyday objects that remind us of the ones we love. Next slide. In Vanessa Brantley Newton's colorful, inviting style, Nesting Dolls encourages readers to look inside to see what makes them so special, just as they are. Anika is in awe of her gorgeous Gullah Geechee family tree. She wants to be beautiful like her older sister, Sori, a great listener like her mom, and a talented artist like her grandma. But sometimes she feels as though she just doesn't belong with these amazing women, and a trip to grandma's art studio confirms just how different she is from the rest of her family. While each member of her family may be distinct, together they possess a deep-rooted beauty and inner strength that have been growing within them for generations. Next slide. Harlem at four. Told in two parts, this stunning and powerful picture book by New York Times bestselling author and Coretta Scott King award-winning illustrator Frank Morrison leaves together the themes of Black culture, family, and the history in the world's most famous Black neighborhood, Harlem. In part one, four-year-old Harlem is the apple of her father's eye, and together they explore the neighborhood, riding the A-train to museum playdates with John, um, John Michael Basquiat, and uh, listening to street musicians play the songs of John Coltrane and Miles Davis. In, two time, in, in part two, time travel back to Harlem in 1904, when Philip A. Payton Jr., the father of Harlem, starts his Afro-American realty company so that beautiful black parents could migrate from the South to raise their children in the North as part of the, black, the great black migration. Next slide. Award-winning author illustrators take readers on a lyrical journey of nature and family inspired by Vietnamese mythology and the realities of making a new home. Long ago, my father, my grandfather came to this new land. He pushed our tiny boat along the surface of the water, gentle as a lullaby, gentle as the waves kissing the shore of our new home. Before it became his home, the jungle was the land, full of awe-inspiring animals, lush trees, and endless water. Still, T feared the unknown. He didn't feel brave or capable, but grandfather stood by his side, reminding him that the world around them is big, wonderful, and ready to welcome them into its song, if they're willing to listen. And now I'll pass it over to Natalie. Hi there, I'm Natalie Capagrossi, here to present a couple more picture book titles, starting with Wawa Goes Tawa. What parent or caregiver hasn't wished to disappear when their usually delightful charge erupts with a volcanic tantrum? Somehow, small kids manage to make their wishes known in the loudest way possible before they are even able to talk. And somehow, it seems this is almost always likely to happen in public. This picture book from a rising Nigerian talent is a funny read aloud with equally amusing pictures. It will make kids laugh and hopefully make caregivers feel seen. Next slide, please. And the Goblin Twins. 
two 601-year-old trickster goblins decide to make their new home together in a strange, unknown land of New York City. As they prepare for the new customs of Halloween, they are in for a surprise. This is a hilarious new picture book from critically acclaimed author Francis Cha and number one New York Times bestselling illustrator Jamie Kim that blends Korean myth with tongue-in-cheek humor. And I'll pass it over to Adrian. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about a few more picture books at this time. Frasier, the Forest Ranger. Fraser of the Forest Ranger is the debut from Matt Shuffman, who spends his days teaching art to kids in grades K through four. It's the heartwarming story that shows your littlest readers that making friends doesn't have to be scary. Great for social emotional learning, Fraser, our main character, loves his job, but wants some friends and sets out to make some. With fun and fresh illustrations, this is perfect for story time in classrooms. Next slide. Thank you, Moon. There is something for everyone in this fascinating nonfiction text with a gentle refrain that's perfect for bedtime. Award-winning Melissa Stewart's newest title is a book about giving thanks while showcasing the moon and all of the animals that rely on it to make it home. Illustrations by Jessica Lannans are, are luminous and bring this nighttime story to life. Next slide, please. Creep Leap Crunch, a food chain story by Jody Jensen Schaefer, illustrated by Christopher Silas Neal, is a beautiful but simple look at how the food chain works for younger picture book readers. From the lowly worm to the king of the forest, it's perfect for classroom use and an easy tie-in for lessons about wildlife, earth science, and even creative writing. And over to Michelle. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Campbell, Assistant Director of School Marketing here at Random House Children's Books, and I will be sharing a little bit more about some nonfiction picture books. First, I am an aunt of a six-year-old little boy who is super, super curious. And last time we were hanging out, I was not surprised that when we were at the park together, he leapt from the swing to chase a beautiful monarch butterfly. And then, of course, he began to ask me all these questions that I didn't know the answers to. But thankfully, there's Rachel Ignatowski. She is super passionate about making science really accessible, beautiful, and fun for young readers. With heartwarming and fluttering illustrations, this nonfiction picture book asks and answers all the questions that kids and adults have about caterpillars, butterflies, and moths. Next slide, please. You may know Megan P. Brown from her recent Texas Blue Bonnet title, Indelible Anne, about the first female governor of Texas. A Texan herself, Megan lives on a farm just outside of Austin called Honey Brown Farm, where she raises bees with her family. It comes as no surprise then that after the 2019 fire of Notre Dame, Megan wanted to tell the story of the honeybee colonies that lived on the roof of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris and survived the devastating event. From the rooftops of Paris to the intricacies of a beehive, this lyrical and poignant picture book is a beautiful story of resilience in the face of disaster. Next slide, please. Grab your popcorn and find your seat for a star-studded celebration of the most iconic women of the silver screen, including Judy Garland, Rita Marino, Marilyn Monroe, and Hattie McDaniel. This is a glamorous tribute to the groundbreaking women of Hollywood's golden age that is sure to earn rave reviews from film, film fans young and old. Next slide, please. Growing up in Florida, I thought books just came from the library. I had no idea how books were made and that working in publishing was even a career path. Good Books for Bad Children is a lyrical picture book biography about one of the most groundbreaking and outspoken legendary editors of the best loved books for children. Children, she used to tell her writers to try to inspire them and encourage them that children really just want to be seen which you'll see is partly how she inspired Maury Sindak, Margaret Wise Brown, and other creators who gave us, as readers, the wonderful stories of Where the Wild Things Are, Good Night Moon, and so many more classics. Next slide, please. 
John Cage, the pioneering, inspiring composer, believed that all sound, from the crash of a slamming door, to the whir of a blender, to the whoosh of the wind, was real music. Told in second person and paired with exciting illustrations as innovative as Cage's music itself, this is a wonderful nonfiction picture book that teaches kids the importance of mindfulness and listening while celebrating John's love for all the sounds in our lives. And now over to Jasmine. Hi, my name is Jasmine and I'll be showcasing a few more of our picture books. Up first, we have In the Dark. When the breeze becomes a blur, blustery storm, everything changes, including first impressions. Told from two perspectives, here is a gentle and timely reminder that all it takes to bridge the gap of misunderstanding and fear between people is an open and willing heart. This lyrical picture book encourages us to set aside our snap judgments and quiet our fears of the unknown by shining light on what has been kept in the dark. Next slide, please. Oh, Panda. From Caldecott Honor winner Cindy Derby comes a new enduring picture book about a panda bear who is determined to climb and overcome a snowy, slippery mountain to be able to join a new butterfly friend. The second person perspective picture book will have young minds feeling immersed into the book and thinking, oh, panda, as a, as a panda attempts with great strive and innovating thinking to reach the top of the mountain. With spare text and dazzling watercolors, illustration, Panda's journey reminds us that with a bit of moxie and a lot of perseverance, we too can reach the top of our mountain. Next slide, please. See you on the other side. From actress, dance, and singer Rachel Montez Minor comes a lyrical picture book about those we've lost and reassurance that we will carry their love with us forever. The lyrical and evocative illustration will offer comfort to children who may be grieving or coming to terms with the idea of loss. The universal message tells us that no one leaves us forever and just because we can't see them doesn't mean they aren't there for their love will always stay with us. And over to you, Erica. And on to chapter books. Next slide. Okay. Um, fans of chapter book graphic novel series will love this next book. What would you do with super magic? Hugo can do whatever and be whatever he wants. Climb a mountain, easy. Smash a table, destroyed. He can even transform into a dinosaur. Jump into the adventure in this hilarious new series with more magic and adventures to come. Next slide. Um, on this slide, we have a few uh, books that are coming out of the Step Into Reading series. Um, so the Step Into Reading series offers books at five carefully developed skill levels tailor-made for the emergent reader. Promoting fluency and providing quality content, Step Into Reading has been trusted by educators for almost 40 years. Can you believe it? And it is the perfect resource for integrating science, social studies, and math. The program also features uh, fiction favorites and includes popular character, characters and properties such as the best-selling how-to series and all are welcome series, which will excite even your most reluctant readers. A lifetime of love, oh, sorry, a lifetime love of reading starts with a single step. And back to Jasmine. And here we have some familiar series. We have A to Z Animal Mysteries to Cat, Bats in the Castle, Join Abby and Lydia and Daniel as they try to figure out what that unnatural sound in Abby's home is. Is it a ghost or something scarier? We also have Permaids, number 14, um, Contest Catastrophe. After Angel finds the missing ballots from the Kitten Tail Cove Library Contest, Angel doesn't know what to do. Is the contest ruined or is there a surprise in store? We have Dragon Storm, number five, Kai and Bone Shadow. When the dragon seers must leave the safety of their hideout, they encounter a fearsome dragon and a mystical potion in a secret lair. The others, see, the others sense danger, but Kai feels strangely drawn to the mysterious force, one with the power to destroy. Will he ignore the warnings of his own loyal dragon, Bone Shadow? And we have Unicorn Academy Treasure Hunt, number four, Sienna and Sparkle. With the final piece of the mysterious treasure map, Sienna and Sparkle are so close to finding the hidden treasures hiding somewhere in their school grounds. But there are others who also want the treasure and will do anything to find it first. Join Sienna and Sparkle as they try to find Sparkle's magic and the treasure before it's too late. Next slide, please. 
Now we have Tig and Lily, your favorite cat and tiger duo, and Scaredy Squirrel, your anxious little fella, are back for more. Party animals. The, the number, the second book in the Tig and Lily series. Join Tig and Lily as they throw the best party ever to meet, of course, the, the rest of the zoo. But Lily's worried. Will her guests be scared of the giant tiger inviting them over for dinner? We also have Scaredy Squirrel gets festive. Scaredy is getting ready for holidays and it's a lot for one little squirrel to handle, especially with all the planning, the decorating, the wrapping. And did I mention Scaredy still has to be an astounding host? Luckily, Scaredy has his friends who remind him of the greatest gift of all, ce celebrating with loved ones. And now back to you, Erica. Okay, and some middle grade. So next slide, please. And we'll start with action and adventure. 15 Secrets to Survival is the New York Times bestselling YA author Natalie D. Richards' middle grade debut. When classmates Baxter, Baxter, Abigail, Turner, and Emerson break a school rule, they're forced to travel to the middle of nowhere for an extra credit project. They think things can't get much worse. After all, how will learning to survive in the wilderness help them avoid trouble in school? What starts as a weekend of team building takes a scary turn when their instructor goes missing and they're given nothing but pages of a survival guide to complete a series of challenges. They soon learn the woods around them have surprises. Will they discover a way to work together to find their teacher and overcome the dangers of the winter in the mountains? Next slide. Very excited about this one, Project F. From the best-selling author of The City of Ember comes a post-apocalyptic story set hundreds of years in the future, where life is simple and modern conveniences are a thing of the past, until a boy enchanted by technology is forced to choose between doing the right thing for his community and pursuing his dreams of adventure. And, next slide. Oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> um, and just want to mention, don't forget The City of Ember is now a graphic, a graphic novel. Um, that, just to recap, is an underground city doomed in darkness. Then two kids discover a secret note that they may have to the answer to bring back the light. But is it too late to save their home? Okay, next slide. Okay, Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library is now a graphic novel. That's right, the best-selling book is now a full-color, fun-packed graphic novel. When Kyle Keeley learns that the world's most famous game maker, Luigi Lemoncello, has designed the town's new library and is having an invitation-only lock-in on the first night, he's determined to be there. But the tricky part isn't getting into the library, it's getting out. Kyle's going to need all his smarts because a good roll of the dice or a lucky draw of the cards is not enough to win in Mr. Limoncello's library. Don't miss this adaptation of the beloved middle grade novel that book was called A Worthy Successor to Willy Wonka. And over to Michelle for some contemporary middle grade. Kelly J. Baptist is the inaugural winner of the Weenie Diverse Book Short Story Contest and the award-winning author of Isaiah Dunn is My Hero. Zoe Sparks is an over-enthusiastic cookie dough seller who wants to win a laptop from her school fundraiser, but her win-at-all-cost attitude is starting to drive a wedge between Zoe, her best friend Felix, and her family. Mixed throughout, there is unexpected competition, bad music, strained friendships, and over-the-top ideas that go horribly wrong. Hand this to fans of stories like Ramona the Pest and Barry and Johnson's books. Next slide, please. Ellie Schwartz, the author of Dear Student, never, feel, never fails to write a pitch perfect middle grade novel that kids and gatekeepers absolutely love. Told and love, alternating, told in alternating perspectives, hidden truth asks, how far will you go to keep a promise? Danny is strong and empowered, trying out for the all boys baseball team and making it. But after suffering a bad accident, she learns that it isn't what you do that matters. It's really who you are that matters. And Eric, who has ADHD, takes on a big company and, and his friend to fight for what they think is right. And they learn that what others see as a weakness in him is really his strength. Both stories come together to address, address issues of guilt and forgiveness. This book really asks big questions that are on kids' minds. What does it mean to believe in something and fight for it? How far do you go to do the right thing? And what happens when the right thing has consequences 
that can hurt the ones we care about most. Is it still the right thing? Next slide, please. Andrea Beatriz Arango is the Newbery Honor winning author of Ivalice Explains It All. And she is a former public school teacher with almost a decade of teaching experience. Something Like Home is a moving novel and verse about Lara, a Puerto Rican American girl who has a very complicated re relationship with her family and her heritage. Lara wonders, how do you explain to others that you're technically a foster kid, even though you live with your aunt and that your parents are currently in drug rehab? Her story normalizes open communication, asking for help, and most of all, being kind. And of course, this is a story about a lost dog who helps a lonely girl find her way home and back to her family, while also finally finding family and each other along the way. This is perfect for fans of Katherine Applegate, Jason Reynolds, and Barbara O'Connor. And now over to Adrian. Some mysteries and thrillers. Field of Screams by Wendy Paris. Rebecca barely remembers her dad. He died when she was six, and she doesn't like to dwell on that fact. But when she travels to the old family farm and discovers not only that he also was obsessed with ghosts like she is, but that he was haunted by the same ghost at the same farm at the same age that she is now saying, it creates a new thread of connection between them. She is compelled to solve the mystery of the ghost for him because he couldn't. This is creepy middle grade perfect for readers looking for a scare. Next slide. Mr. Whiskers and the Shenanigan Sisters. Wendelin Van Dranen, the award-winning author of many titles who got started with the Sammy Keys Mysteries, brings us a wonderful young middle grade story starring a streetwise stray dog detective who is on the case to solve the mystery of the Shenanigan Sisters' missing father. Funny and heartwarming, just like the author herself, this one is not to be missed. Next slide, please. And then just another look at Wrecker. You already heard from Carl earlier in the webinar. So I just wanna mention that we are so excited to have a new funny and fantastic adventure that will keep your readers laughing and on the edge of their seats. The fast paced high stakes and humor make Hyacinth's books hard to resist. Welcome to another wild adventure in, a, in Carl Hyacinth's Florida. And over to Katie. All right, I'm gonna share some fantasy middle grade with you all now. The Dark Lord's Daughter. This is from New York Times, the New York Times bestselling author of Dealing with Dragons, comes a brand new middle grade, a timeless middle grade fantasy novel. Kyla is just an ordinary girl, or so she thinks. When a day at the state fair is interrupted by the news that she's the daughter of a Dark Lord, she and her family are quickly whisked to another world. As her family encounters fantastical creatures in place of their earthly gadgets, Kyla must master the art of magic in order to send her family home all the while grappling with her birthright as a future dark lady. Perfect for fans of Tamara Pierce and Jessica Townsend. Next. Schneider Family Book Award honor winner, Al McNichol, brings us the start of a brand new middle grade fantasy series with Like a Charm. Ramya Knox knew that she was different. Her dyspraxia makes her clumsy and prone to attracting the disapproval of her teachers. Ramya didn't know that she can see magic. As sirens threaten to take over Edinburgh, it's up to Ramya to save the day, or the hidden and the mortal worlds might both be at risk. This is perfect for readers looking for stories with fantastical monsters and mysteries to unravel. Next slide. Alex Wise versus the end of the world. Alex feels like the world is ending. His best friend is leaving for the summer. His former friend and sort of crush hasn't spoken to Alex since he ditched him on the first day of school. And his mom is sending him and his younger sister Mags on a, a cruise with the dad that abandoned them for the summer. None of this, of course, prepares Alex for the actual end of the world when his sister is possessed by one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which sets off an epic battle between good and evil. Now it's up to Alex to save his sister and, of course, the world. This is the start to a brand new fantasy series that celebrates accepting yourself and finding your inner hero. Next. Book two in the Sir Cali series, Sir Cali and the Dragon's Roost. The battle is won, but the war is far from over. 
12 year old non-binary night Callie and their friends learn the tolerance is not the same as acceptance when a fragile piece earned in book one finally shatters. They have no choice but to leave their home and to run. Soon old secrets will be revealed and new allegiances formed that will throw into question everything Callie thought they knew about their world, including what it means to be a hero. Next. Nell of Gumbling, My Extremely Normal Fairy Tale Life. You might think that life in a magical town of Gumbling is like something out of a storybook, but to Nell and her friends, it's just home. Sure, her dad runs a magic star form, farm, and her best friend Myra is a fairy, and her second best friend Gil is as small as her thumb. But honestly, really, Nell is just living an ordinary life in a magical land. Until two strangers arrive in Gumbling, that is, and they start talking about turning it into a resort. Happily ever, ever after might not be as easy to come by after all. From the best-selling author of the OK Witch series comes an utterly enchanting graphic novel diary hybrid that's perfect for fans of Raina Talgemeier and Shannon Hale. And I'll kick things over to Natalie. Hi again. I'm here with a few nonfiction middle grade titles, starting with The Mona Lisa Vanishes. On a hot August day in Paris, just over a century ago, a desperate guard burst into the office of the director of the Louvre and shouted, in French, The Mona Lisa, she's gone. This is a propulsive work of narrative nonfiction about how the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre, how the, how the robbery made the portrait the most famous artwork in the world, and how the painting by Leonardo da Vinci should never have existed at all. Here is illustrated middle grade nonfiction written with the pacing of a thriller, shot through with stories of crime and celebrity, genius and beauty. Next slide, please. And this is part of a new series, Race to the Truth. Race to the Truth consists of high interest, low level, middle grade nonfiction, which tells the history textbooks leave out or misrepresent. And importantly, these histories are written by the communities most impacted by historical events. This is Race to the Truth, Colonization, and the Wampanoag story. Until now, you've only heard one side of this story, the discovery of America told by Christopher Columbus, the pilgrims, and the colonists. Here is the true story of America from the indigenous perspective. Next slide, please. And slavery and the African-American story. From the moment Africans were first brought to the shores of the United States, they had a hand in shaping the country. Their labor created a strong economy, built our halls of government, and defined American society in profound ways. And though the Emancipation Proclamation wasn't signed until 300 years after the first Africans arrived, the fight for freedom started the moment they set foot on American soil. This book contains the true narrative of the first 300 years of Africans in America, the struggles, the heroes, and the untold stories that are left out of textbooks. If you want to learn the truth about African-American history in this country, this is the perfect place to start. Next slide, please. And we have Tasty. Answering questions like, how did cheese happen? Who pickled the first pickle? In Tasty, you will discover it all. Explore the history of innovative food in this nonfiction graphic novel filled with facts, legends, and recipes. This follows author Victoria Grace Elliott's other nonfiction graphic novel, Yummy, A History of Desserts. And I'll kick it over to Jasmine. In graphic novel continuing series, we have Witches of Brooklyn, A Spell of a Time. Epi and Garance learn that there is a missing mermaid with the help of Garance and some talkative seagulls and a rather helpful turtle. Epi is determined to save the day and find this mermaid. The Cardboard Kingdom number three, Snow and Sorcery. It's winter break in the Cardboard Kingdom and the kids from town from the town across the park want to play together. But according to the evil sorceress, not just anyone can join the kingdom. Will the sorceress realize the error of her ways before all hope is lost? And Meow, Max Meow, number five, Attack of the Zombies. Make Max and Mindy are back, and this time there is a bad guy after Kittyopolis speeds called Dr. Zombie. But who is Dr. Zombie? And why would he want to hurt bees? Can Max and Mindy find out in time? Next slide, please. 
back for more, we have Future Land, The Nightmare Hour. This time around, they are taking their spectacular theme park where dreams literally come true, New York City. But when glitches keep happening and a creepy carnival gives Cam goosebumps, Cam can't help thinking something is unusual, or maybe it's just him. The Terribles number three, Clash of the Gnomes. Terribles are back with a game of Klebova, but can the Terribles defeat these gnomes without anyone disappearing into an alternate dimension? Two Truths and a Lion. In the series finale, Sadie and her friends are back, but one of their own gets removed from school and replaced with a new girl with the same powers as Sadie. Can they navigate their secret missions and friendships to bring back their fallen path member or will this adventure change them forever? The last rose. In the retelling of Beauty and the Beast, we find Mira's sister, Darina, has been kidnapped by what they fear the most, the beast. Follow Mira along as she enters the magical haunted castle and discovers the dark secrets that bound her village to the beast. Next slide, please. And now in paperback, we have Vampiric Vacation. From new, number one New York Times bestselling author, Kirsten White, comes the second book in the series. This time, the sinister winter bottom twin find themselves dropped off at Sanguine Puff Spa. And after careful snooping, they might have discovered that this spa may be more than just eerie and might also hold clues to what happened to their parents. The twins will go on the case to investigate what's really going on in Sanguine Spa. We also have Pony from the number one New York Times bestselling author of Wonder, because a new American classic about a boy on a quest to find his father. Guided by a ghost and a mysterious pony, Sela sets out on a peerless journey across a vast American landscape to find his father, a journey that will ultimately connect him with his past and future and the unfathomable mysteries of the world around him. We also have Into the Glades. When Exerius and Cordelia's father, the leader of their village, dies unexpectedly, a dark curse sweeps over the land. The girls know that the curse must be tied to Sirius' death, and they're determined to break its hold on their home and bring Sirius back to life. Together, Cordelia, Larkin, and their two little brothers set off in the into the wild glades in search of, of a witch who'd rumored to have powers to reverse death. But on this journey, the children discover the most difficult challenge isn't wild marsh maids, it's the grief threatening to consume them. And lastly, we have Elfie Unperfect. Perfectionist Elfie Ulster may be thinking everything will go smoothly when she enters her new perfect school. But when she gets expelled on her first day, she is left to, left to go back to her old unperfect school. But sometimes when everything goes spectacularly wrong, you figure out what truly matters and what doesn't. So this terrible, horrible, surprisingly hilarious year may just be the best thing that has ever happened to Elfie. And over to you, Erica. Oh, sorry, Katie. No, I think it's me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so There's No Way I'd Die First is a spine-tingling contemporary horror novel that follows scary movie buff Noelle Lane as she hosts an elaborate Halloween bash. She soon finds the festivities upended when she and her guests are forced to test their survival skills in a deadly game. Debut author Lisa Springer may be new to the horror writing scene, but she has long been a fan of the genre, which is evident in this high-concept, fast-paced novel. This book is perfect for fans of movies like Get Out and readers who like a little bit of everything, slashers, dark comedy, romance subplots, social commentary, and it also features a BIPOC main character who I have to say, spoiler alert, is the final girl. Okay, next slide, please. Monstrous. Don't go outside after dark. Come straight home after church. And above all, never, ever go into Redwood. Forced to spend her summer in her aunt's strange small town, a teen girl discovers dark secrets in the woods. This is the sophomore novel from the author of Bad Witch Burning, Jessica Lewis, and it's a pulse-pounding story perfect for fans of supernatural and Lovecraft country. Like Jessica's first book, this story features a young Black girl figuring out her place in the world and coming into magical abilities while navigating questions of morality and what it means to be a monster. Themes of acceptance and healthy versus abusive relationships are central to this book, as are discussions surrounding whether people can be good and do bad things, and if everyone deserves forgiveness. A nuanced, thoughtful read that will make readers feel seen and understood. Next slide, please. Hatchet Girls. Hatchet Girls is a fast-paced read aloud with dual perspective narratives set more than 100 years after the Borden murders. 
When Mary Ellen Morris accuses her boyfriend, Vic Gomez, of murdering her wealthy parents with an ax, the town is quick to believe her. It doesn't help that Vic is caught standing over her parents' bodies with uh, blood on his hands, unable to remember anything about the night in question. Hand this to fans of Kara Thomas, Courtney Summers, and readers who like contemporary re retellings of the Lizzie Borden crime story. Next slide. The Revenge Game. This is a wickly, wickedly, com com sorry, comedy to feminist mystery about the dark side of a hopeless, romantic, seemingly perfect love story. The Revenge Game takes the classic feminist rom-com and injects it with twists, darkness, and an air of mystery. It challenges tropes it challenges tropes in the same way its female characters push back against the oppressive patriarchal forces at their school. This novel empowers young women, and there is something deeply satisfying in seeing the girls in this story carry out their form of justice. The collision of rejection and the fragility of some men's egos are on full display in the story's narrative, making it a very timely allegory. And over to Katie. All right, the Society for Soulless Girls. Ten years ago, four students lost their lives in the infamous unsolved North Tower murders at the elite Carville Academy for the Arts, forcing the school to close its doors. Now Carville is reopening and fearless freshman Lottie Fitzwilliam is determined to find out what really happened with the help of her roommate, Alex Wolf. This trade paperback original is perfect for readers who love dark academia with a side of enemies to lovers romance. Next slide where there's smoke. When a girl arrives on Callie Christopher's doorstep the day of her father's funeral, dirty, bruised, and unable to speak, Callie takes her in. Word soon spreads around their small town about the girl and detectives come asking questions. But their questions only raise more questions and soon Callie is asking herself, is this girl in danger or is she the danger? Perfect for fans of twisty, edge of your seat thrillers from Courtney Summers, Kara Thomas, and Lori Hall Sanderson. Win, lose, kill, die. Friends Liz, Taylor, Kate, Marcus, and Cole all attend the prestigious and competitive Morton Academy. When a series of murders targets the best and the brightest of the Academy students, the friends vow to discover exactly what's going on. This is perfect for fans of Natasha Preston or Holly Jackson, as well as readers who like shows like Pretty Little Liar, Riverdales, and Gossip Girl. Next, The Haunting. Rounding out our YA mysteries and thrillers is The Haunting from number one New York Times and USA Today bestseller, bestselling author Natasha Preston. Penny's trying her best to forget about her ex Nash after his father was arrested for the brutal murder of four teens. But it's hard to forget what happened, especially around spooky season. When Penny goes shopping for a Halloween costume, she discovers something straight out of a horror movie instead. A classmate stabbed and bleeding out in the dressing room floor. Could this be a copy killer on the copycat killer on the loose. The adults are saying no, but Penny knows better. And now I'll kick things over to Adrian. Okay, plan A. Award-winning author Deb Coletti has been recognized for her authentic and powerful de depictions of adolescence in the real world. From the hashtag Me Too and gun violence in A Heart and a Body in the World to the COVID-19 pandemic in the epic story of Every Living Thing. This, nov this novel features yet another topic dominating national headlines, abortion and reproductive rights. But this isn't a cautionary tale. It is a story of a 16 year old who takes control of her life, makes decisions for herself and her body and is supported by her family and loved ones. It's also a road trip novel and a love story because Deb always gives us hope. Next slide. Now for another literary but accessible novel that teens and adults are going to be intrigued by. Debut YA author Jamie Hong brings us a coming of age story told in two alternating voices. One, a California teenager fighting against her Vietnamese culture and the other, her father as an 11 year old boat person on a harrowing and traumatic refugee journey from Vietnam to the United States. When we asked Jamie what she wants readers to know about her novel, this is what she said. This story is inspired in large part by events that have occurred in my life. As such, I strive to be as honest and authentic as possible. 
Drawing from the narratives of my parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and other Vietnamese Americans, I have woven together a story that is both imagined and speculative. Jane is a wholly unreliable narrator because she, like me, doesn't have a full or complete grasp of Vietnamese history. The, reason for the, the reasons for this are nuanced and complex. Don't miss this one, it's, it's a really great read. Next slide, please. All right, gonna switch it up with some romance. Ryan and Avery. David Levithan is back with a new YA that is, is a companion to his 2013 National Book Award long-listed title, not to mention, often banned, Two Boys Kissing. Told via Ryan and Avery's first 10 dates, we get to see how they meet at a dance, get to know each other, and fall in love. David's legions of fans are going to love this witty, warm-hearted tale of teenage love, queer identity, and self-acceptance. This also happens to be the 10th anniversary of, of Two Boys Kissing, where Ryan and Avery make their first appearance. Next slide, please. For those readers who love rom-cons and movie tie-ins, come see you on Venus. The movie is coming out this July and fans will be able to read it in September. Mia isn't afraid of having yet another surgery for her heart condition, but she can't summon the courage to find her biological father. Kyle can't get over the death of his best friend. So when a twist of fate has them travel to Spain to look for the answers, they both need to move on and how they feel about death and love forever might change as well. This is perfect for fans of Five Feet Apart and The Fault in Our Stars. Next slide. The Borrow a Boyfriend Club. For a price, any student at Noah's Michigan High School can request a date for nearly any event. No student, student needs to stay home alone ever again. Joining the Borrow a Boyfriend Club is the perfect way for Noah to prove his gender, or so he thinks. When his first attempt fails, he strikes a deal with Asher, who happens to be the crabby but good looking president of the club. And as you can imagine, things things go from there. The only problem is one of the major rules of the Borrow a Boyfriend Club is no real boyfriends and girlfriends allowed. Are Noah and Asher over before they even start? Of course not. I said this is a romance. This is a great and fun transgender rom-com. Paige Powers is a new voice in the YA romance community and is a 20-something trans author who brings authentic authenticity, knowledge, and humor to his writing. Next slide. Didn't see that coming. From the best-selling author of Dial A for Aunties, The Obsession, and well, and well, that was unexpected. Didn't see, didn't see that coming is Jesse Totanto's funny and fresh look at the anonymous friends to lovers trope. This time our main character is an amazing secret gamer that never met her online best friend in real life. Suddenly she transferred into his high school and they come face to face. What will he do when he finds out who she really is? Jesse also tackles the experiences of girls in the gaming sphere, the impact of bullying in, in, in a school environment and gender cultural expectations. This, perfect, this is perfect for fans of You Got Mail, Tell Me Three Things, and Alex approximately. And over to Michelle. And we have a couple more romance titles. This is a spoon-worthy, high-concept, fast-paced, dual point-of-view fantasy with Latinx characters who are funny, moody, deeply flawed, and absolutely lovable. About a powerful witch who will do anything to escape the remote island that she's being held captive on, and anything includes blackmailing a notorious, charming pirate who washes up on shore. Angela Montoya is a debut author to watch, and this is perfect for fans of Sarah J. Maas and Sarah J. Maas and the Pirates of the Caribbean. Next slide, please. El Gonzalez Rose is a new voice in the YA community. Caught in a Bad Bowmance is her debut novel, and it's fresh, fun, and contemporary rom-com that your readers are going to love. It's about an inspiring artist who agrees to fake date one of his family's longtime enemies in the hopes of gathering intel strong enough to take down their rivals and keep the family cabin they gambled in a risky bet. 
For all of its silliness, this is a high concept commercial story about two queer boys of color who are falling in love. Their Latin and Asian cultures and identities are not only explored here, but truly celebrated. Hand this to romance readers who love fake dating, enemies to lovers, and star-crossed lovers tropes. Next slide, please. Master storyteller Christopher, master storyteller and international best-selling author Christopher Paulini returns to the world of Aragon and this stunning epic fantasy set a year after the events of the inheritance cycle. In this gripping novel starring one of the most popular characters from the inheritance series, um, a dragon rider must discover what he stands for in a world that has abandoned him. Murtaugh is the perfect book to enter the world of Aragon for the first time or to joyfully return to it. This also includes seven all new pieces of black and white art by the author. Plus, to celebrate the Sorry. Um, to celebrate 20 years of the worldwide fantasy phenomenon of Aragon, we are publishing a stunning illustrated edition that has 50 full color paintings. Next slide, please. Helen of Troy meets Beauty and the Beast in this epic fantasy that is perfect for fans of Leigh Bardugo. In this mythological mashup brimming with Southeast Asian folklore and romance, author Elizabeth Lim explores in a highly relatable way how women and girls are treated based on their appearance and how they can wield power, how they can wield true power in a world that objectifies them. And she poignantly shows how two sisters who are set up to compete with each other and to resent each other end up bonding and lifting each other up despite societal expectations. This twisty royal drama is a great addition for anyone looking for more diverse voices and Asian representation, and also anyone seeking an unputdownable enemies to lovers story. And now over to Natalie. And we have more fantasy, starting with Midnight at the Houdini. A girl discovers a surreal hotel where no one ever leaves. When the clock strikes midnight, she'll be trapped there forever, unless she's able to break free from magic that in turn breaks all her rules. Enchanting, mysterious, and utterly fantastic, Midnight at the Houdini will cast its spell on you. Next slide, please. Her Dark Wings is a passionate reimagining of the Persephone myth. Two former best friends split apart by betrayal find themselves reunited in the underworld. But will either one make it out or will the darkness that's growing in each of them consume them whole? Next slide, please. And it is here, the sequel to Nubia the Awakening. Nubia the Reckoning is the epic fantasy from actor and producer Omar Epps and writer Clarence A. Haynes. This is a powerful saga of three teens the children of refugees from a fallen African utopia who must navigate their newfound powers in a climate ravaged New York City. And I'll pass it over to Jasmine. In nonfiction YA, we have The Unhabitable Earth from number one New York Times bestselling author, David Wallace Wells comes a young adult adaption about how global warming is affecting the world. And if left unchecked, it promises to transform global politics the meaning of technology and, the technology and the trajectory of human progress. In sobering details, Wallace Wells lays out the mistakes and, and inactions of past and current generations that we see negatively affecting all lives today, and more importantly, how they will inevitably affect the future. But readers will also hear loud and clear how his impassioned call to action as he appeals to current and future generations, especially young people. Next slide, please. Now in paper, now in YA paperback, we have the Black Queen. Nova Albright was going to be the first Black homecoming queen at Love It High, but now she's dead, murdered on the cor coronation night. In this multiple perspective story, join us as they try to uncover what truly have it happened to Nova Albright. We have Song of Silver Flame Lake Night. 
In a fallen kingdom, one girl carries a key to discovering the secrets of her nation's past and unleashing the demons that sleep at, at its heart. An epic fantasy series inspired by the mythology and fol folklore of ancient China. This, this Rebel's Heart, a tale of a student-led 1956 Hungarian revolution, an all too timely look at the impact of communism and the USSR in Eastern Europe, set in colorless post-World War II Budapest from Sydney Taylor honor winner, Catherine Locke. And lastly, we have Soul of the Deep, the stunning sequel to New York Times bestseller, Skin of the Sea, in which the world must sit, pay the price for one murderer's choice to save the ones closest to her. But when signs of demons begin to appear, and it's clear there are deeper consequences to Simi's trade, these demons spells the ruined world's ruin. And because of Simi, they now have a way into the human realm. And sending it back to Katie for our closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. That wraps it up from us. For more information about our upcoming books and resources that we've created for these titles, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can see our handles here on the screen and visit us online at rhteacherslibrarians.com. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, everybody, for that wonderful chat and those, uh, that exciting preview of all these books. We're looking forward to keeping an eye out for them. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording, title list, slide presentation, and a certificate of completion. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. ALA's annual conference is in our hometown of Chicago, and Booklist has tons of panels, award shows, and giveaways happening all weekend long. Join us on the graphic novel stage for two hashtag read graphic panels. Our afternoon panel will feature Random House Children's Book graphic novel creator Dave Scheid, author signings in our booth, and panels discussing, discussing book challenges, diversity, and accessibility in audiobooks, and our new magazine, Booklist Reader. Stop by booth number 3729 for details, free swag, and more. We'll see you there. Recently, ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom reported 1,269 demands to censor library books and resources in 2022, the highest number of attempted book bans since ALA began compiling data about cens censorship in libraries more than 20 years ago. Join the Unite Against Book Bans campaign to help protect the freedom to read and empower readers everywhere. Visit uniteagainstbookbans.org for more information, resources, to donate, and more. And remember that you can utilize Booklist to support your library's collection development choices with reviews backed by the ALA. We have a special webinar subscription offer, and don't forget that your subscription dollars help ALA advocate on behalf of libraries, assisting those facing an unprecedented number of book challenges. Email us at info at booklistonline.com for more information. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. And one more huge thank you to our sponsor, Random House Children's Books, and to our panelists, Carl Hyacin, Nancy Sisko, and the entire Random House Children's School and Library team. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time. <laughs>